Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I'm really just going to outline the common complications and then I'm going to let Anjid talk to you about how he deals with them. So the complications that tend to occur are aseptic loosening, instability, joint infection, which can be early or late, and then there are tendon ruptures that occur, particularly associated with the triceps. So if we look back through the literature to Geschwent's paper in 1996, when he looked at 828 arthroplasties that had been done uh, between 86 and I think it was 92, I can't quite see that on my screen, um, he noted that all complications from elbow replacements totaled up to 43%, which was really quite a massive um, uh, complication rate uh, in the literature. And then when he, when um, Mori then looked at a similar thing, but with a much larger number of arthroplasties, 2,938, the complication rate had fallen to 24, just about 24%. And I think that is partly because the experience in doing elbow arthroplasties had improved. And I think as well that the implants that were being used during Maury's survey uh, were um, better quality. And we can talk about the types of elbow replacements and historical um, aspects of that if we have time. So what do we see when we look at them and compare these two studies? Well, I mentioned that Geschwent had a 43% total complication rate when he looked at all the studies he reviewed, and Morris was down to 24%, nearly half. But it's interesting to note that the commonest three type of complication were exactly the same, aseptic loosening, instability, and infection. And in addition to that, uh, you need just to be aware that the ulnar nerve can be damaged when you do your elbow replacement. And Mori noted that if you transpose it, you had a smaller uh, ulnar nerve risk than if you didn't transpose. Uh, Shantanu has already told us that he tends not to transpose the ulnar nerve. I also tend not to transpose the ulnar nerve. And again, in the discussion time, we can talk about why we do or we don't transpose the ulnar nerve. Uh, if we have the time to do that. So if we look at um, and compare unlinked with linked implants, the overall loosening rate, when you look at the information within the papers, is very, very similar, about 5%. But when you look and try and identify in greater detail, you discover that actually, if you look for clinical loosening, which is obviously a a, a late stage problem, but then include ra radiolucent lines one millimeter or more in size, or a shift in the implant position, you actually find that unlinked implants do slightly better than linked implants. And this was in Mori's paper in 2011, and Mori of course uses a linked implant, the Kunran Mori implant, but he was honest enough when he reviewed his work or, or the papers to notice that actually linked implants had a slightly increased rate of aseptic loosening. So how does that happen? This is an unlinked QDO implant. This is the same patient over several years. And the x-ray on the far left of the screen looks really very acceptable. The position of the implant, the humeral and ulnar components look absolutely fine. But over time, what happens on all humeral implants, it doesn't matter if it's a Kudo, a Kunrad Mori, or any other type of implant, the humeral implant will always tend to rotate such that the tip of the implant comes forward. The uh, lower end, the articular end of the humeral component will tend to go backwards. And you see it here, and you see it here where it's almost broken through the uh, anterior humeral shaft. Now if you watch it like this was, it happens. Once it starts to happen, you need to do something about it because otherwise it will only get worse. So when you see a humeral position, humeral implant position changing, 
you need to seriously start talking to the patient about the fact they need a revision. On the ulnar side, the loosening tends to occur um, in an anteroposterior direction. So you get this windscreen wiper effect where uh, the implant is moving in uh, anteroposterior direction and causing damage to the intermedullary bone. And again, if you leave that, it will eventually fracture through the ulna and your revision surgery will become much more difficult. So how do we think about aseptic loosening? Well, if you've got an early failure and you think it's aseptic, then I would suggest that you actually exclude infection because one of the commonest causes of early failure is infection. So you may think it's aseptic, but you need to prove that by doing blood tests and a joint aspiration. Early failure occurs if you've got a poorly positioned implant or if there's impingement occurring. And by impingement, I mean that the implant is impinging on the patient's own bone during flexion and extension. And when that happens, you'll get a force that tends to break up the uh, cement bone interface, causing the implant uh, to, to become loose. When you see a, um, a patient that's had their implant in for some years, and again, it appears to be aseptic, then I would again suggest that you exclude infection because again, late infection can be a problem. If infection is excluded, then you need to uh, look and think about why this is getting loose. And it's usually because there's a failure at the bone cement junction or because of polyethylene wear. So when we moved on to instability, unlinked implants, of course, must have a much higher rate of dislocation than linked implants. But linked implants can still dislocate. But as you can see here, the difference in frequency is much less. But linked implants have problems with bushing wear and disassembly. This is a Kudo implant that's clearly dislocated and that's going to um, need almost certainly a revision. You can try and do a, a soft tissue reconstruction, but nearly always they need to be revised. And this is a Geschwent implant and this is a linked implant and the tip of the ulnar component should be in the middle of the humeral component here, but that's uh, become dislocated. And the normal reasons why this type of situation occurs with linked implants is because the soft tissues haven't been balanced at the time of the primary surgery. So you must make sure that the elbow is stable, whether it's a linked or an unlinked implant at the time you close the wound. And this is three different patients uh, with a Conrad Mori implant in place. And what you see here is that the pin, and this is a pin within a pin, uh, the pin within the pin uh, has started to come apart from each other. And you see it uh, in this patient as uh, evidenced by the pin position not being snug up against the humeral component. Uh, this is a separate patient, but if you left this patient like that, then you'd start to see the pins bending. And finally, a third patient. But again, if you left this patient, this would happen where the pin actually breaks. And when you do a revision, you see this. So this is a normal pin. And this pin here should go inside this pin. Um, but what you find when the flanges here break, you end up with uh, the uh, loss of the flanges because they've broken and then this can slide out of here and you get this polyethylene wear occurring. Infection, um, Geschwent noted a 9% infection rate. The more recent studies by Mori, uh, and I think my own experience would be that the infection rate is, is actually lower now. Um, and uh, certainly when Mori did his uh, review, it was down to a third of the Geschwent infection rate. But um, you need to be aware that the modern uh, anti-rheumatoid drugs uh, do increase the risk of infection. So anyone on a 
a disease modifying drug who's starting to have problems uh, with their elbow do think about infection because it can be a problem in that situation. Uh, I think uh, uh, Amjid's going to just talk about some of these things here. But if you debride an infected elbow, you have about a 50% chance of curing the infection. But Amjid, I think, will tell you that, in fact, if you do that early, you, you probably do better than that. If you do a single stage revision, it's about 33%. You do a two-stage revision, um, and sometimes you may need to repeat the first stage if you haven't, if you can't be sure you've done uh, a good enough initial debridement. But if you do a two-stage, it comes down. And if you literally take out everything, take out all the cement, take out the implant, and do a resection arthroplasty, the infection rate, recurrence rate, is very small indeed. And the last thing I really just need to say to you is just to think about triceps complications. Um, probably higher than two to three percent, probably underreported. And treatment options, you may be able to do a primary repair, or you may need to do some of these other things, like an ankyneus rotation flap using an Achilles tendon, allograft, or hamstring or a ligament augmentation to repair the triceps. You do need to have a functioning, well-secured triceps if you're not gonna run the risk that uh, an elbow replacement may become loose in the future. So in summary, um, two different studies looking at different numbers of elbow replacements, but interestingly, aseptic loosening, instability, and joint infection remain the top three types of complication. And I've put in about tendon ruptures just to remind us all to actually to check the triceps when we've done an elbow replacement. So thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.